Donna Shaver. It's Dr. Donna live at 6:45 on Ridley TV, showing the, the state sea turtle of Texas, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And I have with me as a co-host for this morning Tyler Thorson. He's the vice president of the Friends of Padre. That's right, and uh, I'm also with CorpusFishing.com, and I'm also. Uh, been knowing you for 20 years doing reports, fishing reports on Lago in the Morning. We're also on Lago in the Morning on US 94.7 Talk in Country, and uh, it's great to be here. I love talking about turtles and the beach, and most folks don't know what's going on as far as the Kemp's Ridley. The Kemp's Ridley is the most endangered sea turtle in the world, and we have on Padre Island National Seashore, we have the largest uh, nesting grounds in the United States for them. And uh, this year we're up to 246 that have already nested and we have a, a, a clutch this morning of hatchlings that were uh, laid I guess on uh, April 25th at the 27 and a half mile mark so it takes 45 to 50 days for them to grow up into uh, little turtles and that's what we have here today. Tell us Donna uh, for those who don't know how this started you you and I've been doing this talking together for 20 some years you were here 20 years before that uh, on a Head Start program. Tell us about where you got the eggs and what you used to do with those turtles. Sure, well, I've been here since 1980. There was a program that started before I arrived and uh, was conceived in the mid 70s to try to help restore the Kemp's Ridley population because it was plummeting. And some feared it might even be too late to save it. So uh, the National Park Service with Dr. Henry Hildebrand and Robert Whistler from the Park Service began efforts to form the Binational Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle Restoration and Enhancement Program. And one of that, the parts of this program, of course, was protection of the turtles at the main nesting beach in Tamaulipas, Mexico. But another was forming a secondary nesting colony of them here at Padre Al National Seashore as a safeguard against extinction. So that if some sort of a political or an environmental catastrophe occurred at Rancho Nuevo, you wouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. You'd right. have a safe area in the U.S. <laughs> where Kemp's release could nest and be protected. And we were selected for that because Kemp's release is a native nester. The first published record of Kemp's release nesting anywhere in the world was right here at Padre Island National Seashore before the location of the Rancho Nuevo Beach was discovered. And we're also selected because we're the longest stretch of undeveloped Barrier Island Beach. You and I love this beach. <laughs> yes, There's man. nothing like it. It's unparalleled. In uh, people need to come and see how beautiful it is and what a great habitat it is for wildlife. And so uh, for this project to form the secondary nesting colony uh, through boosting up our numbers nesting here, we received uh, from 1978 to 1988, 22,507 Kemp's through the eggs that were packed in pod round sand sent down to Rancho Nuevo. And uh, the eggs were then shipped back to the National Seashore for incubation. And then the hatchlings were released right on this very same beach, right here. I sat here 40 years ago, uh, it was my first time doing this. Uh, they were allowed to crawl down the beach and enter the surf where they were dipped up in aquarium dip nets, uh, hoping that the exposure to the of the eggs to the pod round sand and the hatchlings to the pod round sand and surf would cause them to imprint or come back to the national seashore to nest at adulthood. And the hypothesis around this was like the salmon and print to their natal stream sure. and come back there to to lay their eggs so we were hoping the same thing would happen here and over time we have started to see uh, turtles come back from this effort <laughs> so maybe a lousy for fishing but if you want to see a uh, camps ridley nest go when the water is close to the dunes or it's really rough and windy they like they like that uh you said arabada means the arrival in spanish and yeah. there's video from 1947 uh in the Rancho Nuevo, 47,000 Kemp's Ridley's nesting at one time. So that's how they're, they're throwing at them, you know, the predators just by their massive numbers. We don't have that, that here on the seashore. In fact, how long does it take before they can come back? Well, how, many, how many years before they come back and, and can lay eggs, roughly? Um, it takes about 12 to uh, 16 eggs, 12 to 16 years before the turtles mature and uh, come back to nest. Do you have, do you have, I know you do satellite tagging and things like that on these. Do, what's your oldest one and uh, what's the longest returning oh, female that you can think of? We started tagging in um, 1991 
and we've had some uh, some the, the longest returns from the market caps, and we also put the pit tag, same type of tag that's put in the dogs and cats. Yeah. We inject the females with those and metal tags, and uh, the we caught some head started turtles that have been years and years that they've come back. We had one that was a 1987 year class that nested this year. So wow. I, I hatched her in 87, oh. and she's been coming back to nest here since 2003. So she's kind of an old friend, and I'm incubating her eggs, so I'm grandma. Oh, and this is pretty wow. Cool. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I've known you since 1998, and back in those days, you get eight eight nests and 12 nests was a like, wow, we got 12 nests. So you'd rarely see them. I've been down the beach a zillion times. So has my friend Nick Meyer with uh, Breakaway Tackle. We'd go down and fish the beach like at least once a week. And in all our times, I've only seen, you know, the nesting was because we'd see the turtle patrollers who uh, man those stations every 15 miles or so. And we'd see them and say, hey, oh, we, oh, we flagged one or we saw tracks or whatever. And I'd usually see you or somebody or Cynthia, they'd be digging up the, the eggs. I've seen that, but I was with uh, fishing with my friend Jay Gardner, who used to be a, a turtle patroller here. Yeah, and he had he still has the turtle eyes. So we pop out on the beach, and uh, Cynthia was there marking a nest at the two and a half, and at about the, not quite the five mile mark. There was a live Kemp's Ridley going over the dune line and laying or, to lay her eggs, and I'd never seen that before, and that was such a joy to to, to behold. Then Nick. You know, I guess everybody sees that was the day there were 28 nests you had on here. And yeah. that was uh, that was the Aravada, yeah, I guess. That right? was the Aravada. We have Aravadas beginning to form here. And that head started turtle actually joined in was a wild one to the Aravada, which was a great thing to see. You've got 62 miles of beach here. So yeah, even if there's 28 of them, it's like, well, you may not see one. So that's why it was uh, it was funny when I was with, with Jay, right about the 10 mile mark, he says, stop. There was. That was that weekend. There was a ton of people on the beach, right? So there was there was a lot of folks at the ten. We, we slowed by this camp, and Jay just happened to notice uh, just uh, some sand off the face of the dune. He goes, "There was one event here," and uh, sure enough, uh, when we came back after going to Yarbrough, the turtle patrollers were there spotting that exact same spot. So you don't lose those turtle eyes. It's like fishing when you, when you try to find structure on the beach, yeah. like oh. Absolutely. Once you know what you're looking for, you know what you're looking for. Absolutely, and we tell people, you know, we can show you slides and go through training like that, but actually seeing them on the ground is really gives you the eye, and you're, it's almost like a crime scene where you're looking for a little piece of flipped up vegetation or flattened down sand, and you do uh, get the eye, and you get better and better, and Jay was a good, good spotter. And that's another thing about our program that's so... Uh, valuable to the community is it's a starter position for a lot of kids or young people when they get out of uh, they seem like kids now and I was that age when I started too and I wouldn't like anybody call me a kid so young people as they are just finishing up college or just get out of college one of their first jobs to uh, see if they do like field biology if it's for them or maybe they they'd be better suited in laboratory work or, or something else but uh, we have many people that come back for multiple seasons and help, and we love that. And others that go on to graduate school and you know, become professors, researchers, run their own program. And, and that's really gratifying to see, helping train the next generation. That's what it's all about, too, passing the torch, because none of us are going to be here forever. We've got to help educate the public and educate our young people so that this does not. This is not for nothing. When we're gone, we know it's in good hands. I'll, I'll take you fishing. We'd love Nick and I will take you fishing. And we'll yeah, do all I that kind of it. stuff. I love it. I love to go down and see it from a, a different perspective. But you are doing this twenty four seven. A I lot am, of the folks, yes. that, like reporters and media, think that hey, oh, they're holding these turtles out just so they can play with them. No, when they come out, no, it's time to go. So, it is. so I get emails from Donna this week, and they all at like three o'clock in the morning. She's sleeping on a cot here at the headquarters, and that's what you do during this time of year. It's your busy time. Uh, of course, later during the year, you have uh, you deal with the cold stunned green turtles that we get in the Laguna, and that has been a big program in saving numbers and huge numbers. It and I know sure has. We have a lot of network of fishermen that fish the bays that see them washed up on, on spoil islands or on shorelines, and uh, that's a big help, and I'm, I'm sure glad somebody's doing that. Well, we're so grateful for the help of the anglers, both with the nesting work, reporting the nesting. And we had a, a day, oh gosh, about 10 years ago, where 
it was a big nesting day and some anglers, instead of going, uh, uh, they put the rods down and they became our turtle tarpers. They put the tarps over us as we were collecting the eggs to help you know, keep it cool and so the eggs didn't desiccate. And they went from site to site with us. We get great help and we're so appreciative of that. Uh, <laughs> we're starting to get fired up. Yeah. and <laughs> So neat to be able to be so close to some place so wild as this. Well, we really are fortunate to have this. We are. It is. We are truly blessed because the longest stretch of undeveloped barrier island beach and with the park serve, preserve and protect for future generations. That's what it's all about. This is for your children and grandchildren yeah. and great grandchildren so they can get to see the fish and the wildlife, including these turtles uh, that were almost lost in the blink of an eye because they were so critically endangered. What I tell people that come to, to work for us is that if you like a challenge, you're in the right spot. Finding nests from Kemp's Ridley is more difficult than all the other species because they're the smallest and the lightest of the turtles. They leave only a faint track. They don't leave, uh, and because they nest during the day, their tracks will crumble under the heat of the sun. Also, they tend to nest on windy days so the tracks blow away quickly. And they tend to nest uh, in association with the passage of fronts. So that's when people want to leave the beach. Yeah. And it can yeah, be thunderstorms. Be Fishing's lousy. Or well, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult, it's difficult in the rough conditions. It, the... It's, and, and they like those rough conditions where the water is higher. They don't have to travel as far up the beach to, yeah. uh, to, to crawl. Uh, so the passenger front's right before, during, and after that. And so I'm really looking forward to later today when this little front comes through. And then the windy days also. So what I look for is the first windy day after it has been calm. It's not necessarily, oh, the windiest day. Oh, we're going to get nesting. If everybody's nested already, you're, you're not yeah. going to. But that first time that the wind goes up over about 18 miles per hour is... Uh, is indicative here but with research you find out more and more all the time and, and my colleague Dr. Thane Wibbles studying the turtles down at the main nesting beach in Mexico I saw footage from an arabata that they had in early June and there was no wind I said where's the wind he said, it wasn't windy he said that for about 24 hours before the arabata he, he used drones he used drones okay. and, and they could see the turtles at the surface just, just looking around. around and waiting. And it may be that they are looking for each other. And when they see each other, and then there's some other condition that they sense, maybe change environmental pressure, then they go. But you have pretty good numbers of uh, oh, have... uh, turtles. We get another, generally the nesting season is like the middle of April until about, uh, like, right middle of June is usually, isn't that? Uh, well, for Kemp's Ridley, they, uh, it's actually the end of March. We've had one nest at the end of March, and they nest in Mexico. See, in Mexico, it's a bigger belt curve. And for us, we've we've been kind of like, you know, like this. You're getting all science on us. They, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay. sorry, but I they, go, mean, they yeah. go all the way to, like, mid-August yeah. in, in Mexico and mid-March. And we, we've we been end of March through July 15th has been our last nest. But we did have a turtle that came up uh, doing what's called false crawl when it comes up and goes back yeah. in. In, in mid April or uh, mid August, so wow. there's the potential it could go a little bit later into yeah, years. Yeah, but usually but, when, but, when we but might, the most we might of it, some years the most most yeah. of it is done by about the second or third week of June. So yeah. we're we're getting on the tail end of it right You're now. You're thinking there might be a arabata or one last fling today because I we have a front it. coming through. Yeah, very unusual. They love the fronts, and it's unusual to have one this time of year. Sure is. And and it's coming uh, pretty soon. So we're looking forward to it. We. We're expecting some more uh, from the, we, we watch for them you know, to come in a second and then a third time. So turtles that nested about May 8th to 13th, we're thinking, hey, they're due again. Yeah. So, and we do, we really enjoy looking at, at the tags and what's found with that. We find a lot of uh, recaptures and we found a few turtles from Mexico that have nested here. And that's interesting to see. How many, how many ones do you have the, uh, the information on, like the, the dog and cat tags and things like that? Hundreds now. Hundreds have been marked with pit tags over time. Since 91, we've been doing it. Every turtle that we see gets a pit tag. Okay. 
Because I know before you used to put epoxy on the top and have some special... Uh, that was with the satellite transmitters, yeah. and I don't have any of those ongoing anymore. We're working on getting all the, the, the last they're, of those they're pretty, ex They're pretty expensive for oh, a shot. Very. And, and then it's like you get a $5,000 rig going out there and a bull shark gets it's like, or it winds up in a, yeah. you know, dying of some other reason. It's, right. It's it's expensive, and we've we found out what uh, the main things we, we aim to do. Uh, the last publication that's going to be out really soon is is I deployed transmitters here at the National Seashore. And we know most of, almost all of our turtles, after they're done here, they go to foraging grounds in the northern Gulf. So we, we want, but that's not the whole population, that's not the whole species. So I, I deployed transmitters simultaneously at the uh, northern and southern anchors of the nesting range, which is us and Veracruz, Mexico, and then the epicenter at Rancho Nuevo at the same time, and then weighted the data by what they represent in the population, like the Rancho Nuevo, that's the most. Uh -huh. So uh, so we've got that view, and the ones for Mexico, uh, the ones for Veracruz, most of them go to the Southern Gulf and the Yucatan for foraging grounds. In Rancho Nuevo, it's a split, but the majority are the Northern Gulf. A guy was so, asking... We we had uh, 98 individual hatchlings from a nest of April 25th, and that was at the 27 and a half mile mark, something like that. That's right at the end of Big Shell. That's right near Baby Nash's Hole, as we call it. A friend of ours has a favorite fishing spot over there. So uh, this is incredible. You know, I've been out to see these things, but I've never been able to get this close to Donna and the, the hatchlings, and they really are tinier than they look. These have been... Uh, incubated since uh, April 26th or so, and uh, the average time is 45 to 50 days. Most of these are females. They they want to hatch them at 32 degrees Celsius. That's 89 for you folks here, the Estados Unidos, and uh, you'll get 70% of the females. Since we mentioned before that the they are uh, not monogamous, they, they, they'll take any old male, so being the species we want to recover with the uh, eggs, of course you want to have more females so you have faster recovery because there's always plenty of males around. 30% of these are, are males. We don't find that out till after they've passed away or they have samples because they don't, you can't uh, sacrifice individual threatened, uh, excuse me, endangered species for scientific study. So these are all uh, precious to all of us and about 1% of them come back or as Donna said, one in 400 is expected to come back and, and nest on the seashore. So. You got to throw a lot of numbers at them, and we have uh, roughly how many hatchlings do you expect this year? You'll have. Oh God! Uh, from we hope to get more nests. I'm hoping we end around 300 nests for Texas this year, based on the year-to-date total. And from that, we should get probably about 85 percent hatching success. So that's going to be thousands and thousands of hatchlings going out and. You know, going with them and taking their hopes that some of them are going to come back in 12 to 16 years and come back to nest and and hopefully you'll you'll be there. I'll yeah, be there. Sure. sure. And, uh, <laughs> For those of us you who are in COVID uh, mode and you're just changing into your daytime yoga pants and haven't watched Tiger, uh, the Tiger thing yet on uh, Netflix, this is a one of the we call it a live hatchling release because of COVID rules they're not able to have the general public come to these things. And it's such a shame because anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people show up at these. And Donna will normally do between 20 and 25 of these public hatchings, hatchling uh, releases. And it, it's, you know, you just have to find when the schedule of the turtles are. There's nothing you can go plan on like, hey, let's pencil in Saturday the 20th for this. You can't do that. They, they go when they're ready. So you just got to keep an eye on the uh, Seashores page on the uh, Potter Allen National Seashore uh, Division of uh, sea turtle, turtle science, science and, and recovery. recovery and that's Donna's pictures on there that's where we're doing this live Facebook thing you find the schedule on that and you can watch it later and hopefully at one point maybe they'll release the uh, maybe next year we'll be able to see the hatchlings again uh, because we get roughly 30,000 people that come specifically to this area of uh, Pottery Island National Seashore to visit and, and see this and that's you know like a million dollars worth of tourist dollars coming that we won't have necessarily this year so we appreciate all of you who tune into these uh, broadcasts to see this stuff because it's there's nothing like it, honestly. If you've never uh, seen one, it's, it will bring tears to your eyes. I know it does to you, Donna. Well, it really does, and I've been 
releasing these turtles for 40 years now and every single release is important and is special to me and and uh, I enjoy everyone and care about everyone and and I want to share that with people so because these are the, your turtles these are for the next generation and for the American public and and our of course our comrade our uh, our friends down in Mexico as well and the, the global community and we really love to have our public releases. It's a, such a disappointment that we can't this year. But having you here, Tyler, to help spread the message using your social media will really be able to, to allow us to amplify our message. Uh, we're, we're not pros on the radio or social media. Oh, well, we're not either. Anything, so we're, <laughs> we're just winging it, right? This is our first Facebook Live, in fact. So uh, we'll... We're learning as we go along, and we appreciate the help of pros like you. Because uh, it, it's a little bit scary without that 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 help. And you've got such specific knowledge too that we are so grateful for. Oh, thank you. One. When we get back to normal schedule, you need to have your kids come out here, grandchildren, whatever, and see what a remarkable thing these hatchling releases are. We have a couple of more nestings probably between now and uh, next two weeks. Uh, if you want to come down to the beach, you might see one. You might see one on the beach. Again, drive slowly because they are daytime nesters. That's why the speed limit is 15 miles an hour. You'll see turtle patrollers every 15 miles up and down the length of 62 miles of seashore. So watch out for them and enjoy them.